Happy Easter, everyone. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is risen. Amen. God bless you all, my brothers and sisters, dear guests. Welcome to Bethania Church. I would like to invite you to open the Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, and uh, we will read 10 verses from uh, uh, Matthew 28. It's the moment that happened the very early stage of the resurrection morning. And uh, I'll invite you to open the Bibles, either the this version or the phone version or anywhere. But I think it's very important to have the Bible and read the text and be engaged with uh, the text. Now, after the Shabbat, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples and he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. My brothers and sisters, the most important three phrases in the day of resurrection was this. Actually, one was repeated twice. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. And Jesus said to them also, do not be afraid. The message of resurrection, it's this, do not be afraid. The second most important phrase was, he is going ahead of you, or he is going before you. Now my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is going ahead of me and I will follow him. I don't know what Tuzda tells you, but this gives me a lot of encouragement because he goes ahead of me, before me, I can face tomorrow. Because Jesus is already there. I'm not afraid of tomorrow. I'm not afraid of my exams. I'm not afraid of my doctor appointments. I'm not afraid of anything. Because Jesus, my Jesus, our Jesus is already there. I don't know about your Jesus. But if that is real, I think it's, it's just fair to say a hallelujah. Are you awake? Yeah? I'm not afraid of tomorrow because Jesus is already there. Can I say it again? I am not afraid of tomorrow because my Jesus is already there. And he's waiting for me saying, Avram, rejoice. This is the third message of the resurrection. Rejoice. And I invite you to all stand. And with the choir, with the worship band, let's rejoice 
in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and give him praise because he is worthy of all the honor. And we all, let's come together and sing this. I think it's a, one of the most knowing, knowing songs uh, about Easter. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I don't know, maybe you need, um, I don't know if you drank your coffee or what you need this morning, but I want you to be happy in the house of the Lord. I don't want to see, and even if somebody is, is sad or stressed or worried or fear, fearful or in anxiety, our Lord and Savior can set them free this morning. Amen? So let's all come together in one voice and praise our Lord because He lives. We're not afraid of tomorrow. Let's sing. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know He holds my future. Our life is worth living just because He lives. God sent His Son, they call Him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because He lives, I can face. Brothers and sisters, let's have a moment of prayer to give thanks and glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
let's continue to worship through songs and to look to the Lamb and give Him glory and honor. Amen.
him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to lose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scrolls or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven hills. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as thought it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out to the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nations, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times, 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as they are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever Amen To him who sits on the 
this crown we glory now the Savior now to wash our feet now at his feet we bow of Jesus we can declare the victory and prepare this morning to declare victory over your situation get ready and prepare to declare victory because of Jesus open your heart church open your heart
not just that we declare victory, but we can live in victory. Amen? Turn around to your neighbor and say, you can live in victory from today onwards. And as we may be seated, we'll continue to sing the next three songs and to worship God with the choir and the worship team. Let's all live in victory because of Jesus. Amen.
have a hope and we have a future. Because of Jesus, because He's alive, we are alive. Because He's alive, there will be one day when we're going to see Him face to face. Oh, what a day. We can't wait for that day when we're going to see Him face to face.
be a day when we, we're going to see him. We're going to join the resurrection, the saints that lived throughout the generations. And with one voice, one heart, we will sing together. Word is he who saved us. Word is the Lamb of God. Word is the Lamb of God. Word is the Lamb of God.
DC who overcame. And because he overcame, we overcome. Because he overcame, we overcome. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a joy. What a joy. What a hope. This is good news. This is good news. Our God lives forever. And we live forever with him. In Christ, we live forever. What a joy. Let the joy of the Lord overwhelm our hearts and our faces. Amen. It's not fair. And it's not, it's not fair. We, we, we are full of joy in other places, in the things we like, and in the church without Savior. Let the joy of the Lord fill our hearts and fill our bodies. Yes, He is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be praised. The name of Jesus is worthy. He is above all, every other name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He must receive the praise of His church. Don't hold it back. Give it to Him. He is worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, choir. May God bless you. Now we'll prepare our hearts for the next moments when the kids' choir will come on the stage and uh, will perform two songs. And after the kids' choir, the orchestra. So I would like to ask the ushers to come and just prepare the scene with the chairs for the orchestra. And while uh, we prepare for this, I would like to ask if there's anyone for the first time this morning with us. I'm just looking on my right here. If there's anyone here with us for the first time, I just want to welcome you and bless you. Nobody here? No? On this side, anyone here with us for the first time? No? What about here? Anyone for the first time? Oh, nobody for the first Oh. Yes, I can see my brother. Where you come from? I would love to hear it. Cork, God bless you. Welcome in our church. Okay, anyone else? No? What about here? Mainly the first timers. Oh, yes, I can see. Where is the ladies are coming from? Chicago. Welcome to Bethania Church. May God bless you. And have a wonderful time. Let's all give them a clap of applause. Anyone else for the first time here? Yeah? From? From South America. South Africa. God bless you. We're so happy to have you. And welcome in our church. Anyone for the first time at the balcony? No? God bless you all and we're so happy to have you all this morning in this special day of event. Oh, look at the kids' choir. God bless you guys. I look forward to hear you singing. I heard there's a lot of preparation in the last week, so we pray for you and the Lord will give you strength and power to sing with all your voice. Amen? Yeah, so they'll perform for two songs and uh, after that the orchestra will be ready to, to sing. Yeah? God bless you all.
Thank you.
done. Well done, guys. God bless you. Wonderful performance. I would like to invite the orchestra to come on the stage as well. And uh, just one thing for us. Uh, I'm all for clapping. Don't get me wrong. I'm not the old-fashioned guy not clapping. But I think our children deserve something more. Do you agree with me? They deserve, yes, I agree with clapping. I'm not against that. But they deserve our blessings. Can we all say, may God bless them? We can do better. Together as a choir. Yes, that's different. I'm for clapping, but I think we can do better than clapping. Words have power. And we as parents, we are called to bless our children. Thank you very much, the teachers, the parents, the supervisors. There's over 16 behind these 140 children in the kids' choir. Over 16 adults that are helping them, encouraging them, and supervising them when they do the practice on a Friday. So we thank you guys, we bless you, and uh, we glorify God for the gifts that he put in you. Now, orchestra is next about... I think 40 children. Thank you, Abel, for helping, helping us. You, you deserve some blessings, Abel. He deserves some blessings, yeah? He's doing a great job. And uh, uh, it's not just running around, but it's also a lot of challenges behind the, the scenes with the technique part. And uh, it's wonderful to see the children and youths that were born in our church are developing and they are serving the Lord in so many ways. Behind this wall and on to my left, there's also a strong team with the media guys that are preparing for, you know, and they are ready for the live streaming. So if you're with us online, we greet you, we bless you, we wish you happy Easter, wherever you may be, we uh, kindly ask to give, share and subscribe and like and uh, uh, we want to be a blessing for anyone around the globe. Um, are you ready, guys? Yeah? Okay. We'll bless you at the end. But we can bless you now as well. <laughs> Just to encourage you. Okay. We look forward to, to hear you. And while the orchestra is praising the Lord, I'll uh, invite the ushers to be ready to pass the offering basket and to honor God with our giving. Thank you.
Well done, guys. God bless you. And we all say, and may God bless them. Let's say it again. May God bless them. And may God bless Alexandra as well. I know they call her Ale. <laughs> Wonderful performance. I like, the usher. I like to ask the ushers to come and take the chairs away. And I'll invite uh, Brother Josh to come forward to read the Word of God and uh, preach the Word of God. And uh, at the end, we will have also the Holy Communion. And uh, Brother Sinan will lead us into this. So, uh, Josh... God bless you. We look forward to see what the Lord has to speak through you. I invite you to, I invite you to stand up on your feet as we read the word of God from Luke chapter 24. Verse 13. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Up to here, the word of God. My subject for today is facing a dead end. You may be seated. If you remember last time I was here, I shared a picture of our family and Well, surprise, surprise, we were five people back then. Now we are six. So we thank God for a little baby girl in our family. And yet, isn't she cute? Gorgeous. And I'm still, I'm still in training. Like, I'm still getting the hang of it. I'm not doing the messy stuff. I'm still learning how to hold a baby. I think God is training me for when I have my own baby. So I'm in training, guys. But we thank God for this beautiful baby in our family, and we thank you for your support and prayers, and we appreciate everyone's kindness and words of encouragement. Now, back to the text. We are on the road with two disciples, One of them is named Cleopas. They're coming from Jerusalem. It is the third day. The third day, Resurrection Sunday, and they have just heard reports that Jesus is alive. They don't believe it because they've seen him suffer too much. They're probably talking about how cruel his suffering was, how 
disheartening it was to see him up on that cross and how he was betrayed and how he was mocked and beaten. And in their minds, they could not comprehend that Jesus was alive. The funny thing is, there in that moment, there's two disciples, one named Cleopas, the other one we don't know because the Bible doesn't tell, but some assume that it could be his wife. So we have Mr. Cleo and Mrs. Cleo that are on a journey toward Emmaus. They're coming from Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was the place, if you remember, where Jesus told them to stay because that was the place where the promise was to come. The funny thing is, they're going away from the promise, and there in that moment, Jesus shows up. Now Jesus is showing up on Resurrection Sunday. He's just defeated death, hell, and the grave, and you'd expect Jesus to be out somewhere, be with the crowds, be out in the public and displaying himself to the Romans and to the rulers that handed him over and put him to death. But no, Jesus is on the road and he follows these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. It's a seven mile journey and it's a seven mile journey where these two disciples are downcast, disappointed. They had hopes, they had dreams that this Messiah, this person they knew, this person they followed, this person they spent time with, would be the person that would deliver them from Roman oppression. And what's funny is, as Jesus is walking up towards them, they don't recognize him. And they're talking about Jesus to Jesus, and it's ironic that Jesus is right there, and still, they don't recognize him. My question to you today is, what is keeping you from recognizing Jesus as the risen, living Savior. And I wanna have three points today, and they all start with the letter D. And I thought it would be cool to say, can we see Jesus in 3D? Can he, we see him alive, actual, manifesting himself within our lives, on our road, on our journey? And now the disciples walking away from the promise, walking away from the place they had believed, the place they had expected Jesus to do great things, they're walking away. And as they're walking, Jesus comes to them. And what amazes me is that God is into following us on the journey. He's not just a God that looks for us in the destination, but he's a God that looks for us in the detour. He's not just the God that looks for us out there when we're perfect, when we've got it all together. He's a God of the next step and the next step and the next step. And when I'm on the road, on a dusty road, he says, I'll follow you, I'll search for you. You may be going the wrong direction today, but there's good news that Jesus is coming your way and he'll follow you when you're right, he'll follow you when you're wrong, he'll follow you when you're strong, he'll follow you when you're weak, he'll follow you when you make mistakes and he'll follow you when you're on the right track. But even now, Jesus is saying that he is with us. That's the presence of God in the detour. Thank you, Jesus. That's what he's been doing all along from the first moment he's been looking for Adam and Eve in the garden. He looked for Moses in the desert. God is into searching for his people. And today, he's searching for you. Where are you, Hallelujah. Cleopas? Where are you, my disciple? Where are you going? God is not into finding us in the destination. He knows we're not perfect, so he finds us in the detour. And what I love about this is it says seven miles. Seven is the number of perfection completion. It reminds me that seven miles away, he'll be with me every step of the way. He won't abandon me. Hallelujah. Everything he started in my life, he will bring to completion. Hallelujah. And I'm grateful that God doesn't give up on me. Yeah, there's better people out there than me, but I know that even if I fail, God has my back. 
and he follows me. <laughs> They're talking to Jesus, about Jesus, failing to realize that there was Jesus. Do you know that song, There Was Jesus? There was Jesus when I had it all together. There was Jesus when I was falling apart. There was Jesus when I was in the hospital room. There was Jesus when I was in the exam room. There was Jesus. And they're talking about Jesus as if he was. And he was with them. But now, did they realize that he is still with them? There was Jesus, but there is still Jesus. And they're standing next to hope, and they're hopeless, and they're standing next to power, and they're weak. God does not just meet us out in the detour, but when we're downcast, when we're hopeless, he meets us, my second point, in disappointment. God meets us in our disappointment. Cleo and Mrs. Cleo had an expectation that Jesus would deliver them from Roman oppression, Roman rulership. They had these expectations. And I wonder if we have some expectations that are not on God's agenda. Verse 20 says, he was handed over. He was handed over to the rulers and the high priests. And the word there, handed over, I learned this this week, in the Greek is paradidomai. And it's, it's significant, and I'll tell you later why it's significant. So the Greek word is paradidomai. He was handed over. Judas handed him over to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin handed him over to the high priest Caiaphas. Caiaphas, the high priest, handed him over to Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate handed him over to Herod. Herod handed him over to death upon Calvary. Paradidomai, handed over. And they, verse 20 says, had this expectation, but it was handed over. This hope was handed over. And it says, but we had hoped that he was the one. We had hoped, but our hope was handed over. Paradidomai, it was handed over. And when we seen Jesus on the cross, our hope was there on the cross with him. And we had this hope and we had this expectation that Jesus was the one who was gonna intervene in our disappointment, that he was gonna show up, that he was gonna work a miracle. How many of us had this thought, this expectation that God was gonna show up? We had hope that he would work in our children's lives. We had hope that we would be married by now. We had hope that we, would be, we wouldn't be still struggling with financial death. We had hope that our character would have changed by now. We had hope that this addiction might have been gone. We had hoped. And it reminds me of the passage, if you remember, with Martha having a hope that Jesus would show up, that Jesus would show up to the tomb of Lazarus And he does show up. He shows up a bit too late. Some of us have these cliches. God is always on time. Not always. Sometimes you will feel disappointed. Sometimes you will feel let down. But why does God do that? Is there a reason behind that? We've seen God in the detour. His presence is there. I want to remind you this morning that there's a promise even in the disappointment. My question to you is, can you still have hope even after three days? Can you have hope even on the fourth day? Lazarus was dead on, for four days and In Jewish custom and tradition, it was believed that the spirit would ascend only after the third day, on the third day. And it's funny that Jesus waits till the fourth day so Lazarus can be dead. 
He's really, really dead. And Martha tells Jesus, God, if you would have shown up maybe just before, maybe just at the right time, but God doesn't do that because God is not interested in fulfilling our agenda, but fulfilling his, his purpose and his plan. Our ways are not like his ways. Our thoughts are not like his thoughts. And even in the disappointment, God shows up. It looked like a dead end. It looked like it was over for Martha and Mary. But even then, Jesus reminds them of a significant truth that I want us to remember today. He says, I am the resurrection. They're facing a dead end, and Jesus says, I am the resurrection. Do you believe that I am the resurrection? Do you believe that I can raise Lazarus from the dead? And Martha says, yeah, one day, one day, one day I'll experience the resurrection. One day I'll see the hope that was promised to me. But God is not just about saving us when we get to heaven. God wants to show up in our disappointment here and now. In this place, in this moment, he says, I am the resurrection. And he asks the crowd an important question. Do you believe it? Do you believe that I am the resurrection? Do you believe that I can still do something? Do you believe that with me all things are possible? And that's the question he asked them then. It's the same question he asks us now. Do you believe I can do something with a dead tomb, dead body, a dead situation, a dead relationship? Do you believe that I can do something even facing a dead end? And so Jesus says, take me to that dead end. Take me to the place you buried him. Can we take our disappointments to Jesus? Because he said something very important. He said, yeah, he will suffer. He will be found in sickness, but sickness is not the end. Glory awaits. There is a glory that awaits for us to be revealed through us to be shown to the world. So Jesus comes up and says, this will not end in death. And we think like death is the end. We think disappointment is the end. We think hardship is the end. Now Jesus, the resurrection, stands before death and says, I am the resurrection. And says, I am the one who can save you. I am the one who brings hope. Now, in moments like this, my third point is, what decision will we make? What decision will we make? He tells the disciples on the road, how foolish are you to believe? Slow of heart, that death would be the end. If he did it before, why can't he do it again? And he starts explaining from Moses all the way to the prophets why Jesus was the one who would save Israel. And the journey doesn't start, doesn't end there. For many of us, it starts where we are, but where it ends is up to us. Your disappointment is not the end. If you choose today, it's your decision. If you wanna see God manifest himself in your disappointment, in your detour, you have to make a decision. You have to make a decision and call Jesus over 
to the place where it looks like there's no hope and there is no chance, but it's just the right hope for you to believe that only Jesus can. So they're on the road and Jesus keeps explaining for hours that he was the one, that there is still hope. And on the road, they reach another dead end they reach a mouse. And right there, verse 30, 29, it says, the disciples ask, ask Jesus, can you stay with us? This is the decision the disciples make. Can you stay with us? It's getting dark. There's really no hope, but you gave us a bit of hope. The way you talked amazed us, the way you spoke really encouraged us? Would you stay with us? And so, Jesus, what does he do? He comes in. And he comes in because he wants to work something within. He wants to do something not just in our circumstances. Yes, we will be disappointed, but he wants to show us there is a living hope on the inside. We can go through disappointments and we can experience detours, but the dead end is not the end. With Jesus, there's always a way. And if you believe, you will find it. So Jesus comes in, and he comes in, and he comes in at the table. He comes in at the table, and now after being shoulder to shoulder with the disciples, he now wants to stand face to face. I believe he wants to stand face to face with each one of us today. He wants to stand in communion with us. Have you made a decision to stand before the Lord? And here's what he does, it's so beautiful. He's at the table and he takes the bread. When God comes into our lives, he takes over. He was a stranger to begin with. He was a guest, and now he's the host. When you invite God in, expect him to do something new, to show himself in a new way, to make a path where there is no path. God will do that. And he takes the bread. He breaks it. In that moment, Scripture says, their eyes were opened. Then they seen Jesus in the breaking. What did they see in the breaking that they hadn't seen before? They saw his wounds, the marks in his hands and he handed it to them. God's love is so great that it will lead to a cross. It will show us that though we are broken, there is still hope. There is hope for each one of us because in the hands of Jesus, who was beaten, mocked, made fun of, he took in his hands our disappointment, so that we can believe again, and we can know that he works all things out for good. Disappointment is not the end, but what decision will you make? This thing that he did, this routine, he took it, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. We've seen this before. It's not the first time he's done it. He took it, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. He did it at the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. He did it, feeding of the 5,000, where he took it, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. He did it with people too. 
He did it with Moses. He took him, he blessed him, he broke it, and he gave him to the world. He did it with Joseph. He took him, he blessed him, he broke it, he gave him to the world. He did it with Saul, Paul. He was heading in one direction. He took him, he blessed him. He broke him, and he gave him to the world. What is he doing with you this morning? Can he take you? Can he bless you? Can he break you? And can he give you to the world? God wants to use you. He is present on the detour. There is a promise in the disappointment and there's a purpose in the decisions you make. Make the right decision today. And if you haven't invited Jesus in, maybe it's the right moment now. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, maybe today, in this moment, it's a time to open your eyes and see there is a purpose for every decision I make and there is a promise in this appointment. There is a presence in my detour, but only if you have Jesus within your life. So this morning, I encourage you to make a decision to follow Jesus. He's followed you all the way. Will you follow him now? He stayed upon that cross and he said, it is finished. It is finished. The mission is complete. It looked like defeat. It was actually triumph. And he says in the following verses that he gave up his spirit. You know, that word means paradidomai. He handed his spirit over to the Father. On Friday, until Sunday. And on Sunday, he made a visit to the enemy's camp. And he told the devil, hey devil, it's over. It's over, death has been defeated. Hand it over, the keys to death, hell, and the grave, the keys to your disappointment. Devil, hand it over. There is hope in his hands. There is a second chance in his hands. There is a new life in his hands. Let's close our eyes today. If there's anyone here who wants to follow Jesus, this is the moment. If you want to make this decision today, I want you to raise your hand. God bless you. If there's anyone else that wants to make this decision today, to place Jesus, God bless you, in your heart and to know that you have worth, there is value, you are loved, you are chosen. Let's pray this prayer together for those who are coming to Jesus. Heavenly Father, I place my life in your hands. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I place my life in your hands. Today I ask you to come into my life. Make me a new creation. Forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, I thank you for what you've done for me. Today I will follow you for the rest of my life. Amen. Let's stand up on our feet. And let's have this moment of communion together, face to face with Jesus. And uh, I'm going to say, church, that Jesus is risen. Amen? Amen? Indeed, He is risen. It's amazing to hear that He is risen not just 2,000 years ago, but He is risen in our lives. Amen? Amen. And although we are reminded this morning and today that Jesus Christ has resurrected in order for us to receive eternal life, a few days ago, there's a day called... Friday, but there's another word for it. What is it called? Good Friday. 
while it's a good Friday for us, it wasn't so great for Jesus. It was a day which is followed by extreme pain, mockery, and a God who came in order to forgive, to show love, treated in that way, in that manner. As we stand and we are reminded ourselves of what He's done for us, I want us to have a thankful heart. I want us to have a joyful heart. But also, but also to be grateful for the things he's done. I'm going to ask Brother Christie to have a moment of prayer, of thanksgiving and remembering of what Jesus has done for us. Heavenly Father, we come before you in praise. We come with joyful hearts for the sacrifice that you've done in the Calvary. We're here to praise you. We are here because you died for us, because you loved us so much that you sacrificed your life for us. So today, Father, as, a gest- as, as an offering to you, we want to give you our lives to you because you're, wor- you, you're worthy of it. Now, Father, we want to pray for the bread that's in front of us for the fruit of wine that is also in front of us. It represents your body and your blood. Bless them, Father. Bless them in such a way that when we take part at them, our lives to be filled with life. But not an ordinary life, but with your life, with heavenly life. Fill us with your spirit, with the spirit that rose you from the dead. And help us to come before you with wholehearted help us to quit on the things that we need to quit and give us strength and power to follow you willingly and lovingly because we love you because you loved us first blessed be your name amen just before we get a chance to partake in the Holy Communion this morning, I want to remind you of, um, of something which probably most of you are aware of, but it is of how the sin first came into the world. And although at the root of it, it was disobedience, it came through eating of the fruit. It came through uh, Eve and, and Adam eating the fruit of the the tree of knowledge and good and knowledge. While that's how sin came into the world, and the Bible says that as they took it, their eyes opened and they seen that they were naked and then they were ashamed. They began to understand that what they've done was disobedient to God and they became ashamed of it. They have sinned, they have turned away their head, their face from God. Now there's a passage which Josh was talking about. I didn't talk to him before this. But there's a passage just as he follows from this text. Which also talks about people's eyes being opened. And it says in Luke 24 verse 30 and 31. It says that when, we're, when they were at the table. He took bread. He gave thanks. And broke it, it. And began to give it to them. Then their eyes opened. And they recognized him then he disappeared from their sight there's a second moment when their eyes opened and they began to see that their sin will no longer rule them that they don't have to be ashamed anymore but they can now stand in the righteousness of Christ so while sin came through eating also righteousness comes through the breaking of the bread while eating brought curse onto this world, eating is also bringing blessing into this world. While the tree of God of knowledge brought a shame, brought disgust, now the tree of life, our Jesus, brings us life. So we are no longer ruled by the 
mistakes of our past, by the sins of our past, but now we stand with a new hope in our Jesus Christ. There's a passage in Corinthians chapter 11. I'm not going to read it, but it talks about three things. One, it says that when you do this, remember me. So brothers, this morning, I want us to remind ourselves of what Jesus has done. And it doesn't talk about remember your mistakes. Remember how you came here. Remember what you've done before you came here. Remember what you said. Remember the, the circumstances, the things that happened into your life, the inconvenient things we probably don't like. No, don't remember that. But remember me. So this morning, we, we are reminded of what Christ has done for us. Ten. It says, proclaim my name. As you do this, you proclaim my name. They were looking into the future. Now we look back. But we are also reminded that we also have to look into the future. For although we are here a few hundred, there'll be a day when there won't be a holy communion, but there'll be a heavenly communion. So that is what gives us strength. That is what gives us, gives us purpose. That's what gives us hope. That there'll be a day when we will dine at the, in the same place with all the saints, with all the angels, with all the heavenly creatures in the presence of the Almighty. And the last thing, it says, look at yourself and take this in a worthy manner. For so long, I thought this meant that I have to be worthy to take this. And the Bible never talks about that. It doesn't say you have to be worthy to take it. No, it says take it in a worthy manner. And if you look at a few verses prior to this, it talks about looking around. The one to the next, next to you. Look at them. And in, that, in this passage, there was a lot of poor people and a lot of rich people. And those rich people at the Holy Communion, where they were eating together, they were bringing food because the poor didn't have anything to show for and what they were doing, they were coming with their plate and eating themselves. And those poor people are going back without eating nothing. So when they says, take the, take the Holy Communion in a worthy manner, look unto your left, look unto your right, and don't say that you love God and you hate the one beside you. This is what we have to look at ourselves and say, I am worthy to take it because I love the body of Christ. I love ch uh, churches churches uh, the body of Christ church the church of God I love them I love them and I will take it accordingly accordingly now as we think about these things that we're reminded of what Jesus has done for us as we look into the future when we will dine with him at the same table and also look around if there are broken relationships and if there's something we can do the Bible says leave your gift and go and fix them first before you take it, before you take this bread with your brother and sister, make sure that every situation, every problem, every uh, inconvenience between one another is solved this morning before you do that. So as we think about that, I want to ask the worship team while we meditate on that, while we pray about that, I want to ask the worship team to lead us into our next song. And then as together with the ministers, we'll break the bread and prepare our heart to dine with one another and to the one who is most high, our Jesus.
those who can take part, part in the Holy Communion, are those who have uh, been baptized at a mature adult age and have decided to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I would ask kindly uh, for those who um, have done so, for those who, who have been baptized and who have look at, looked at their life and they have um, decided to take this Holy Communion in a worthy manner to remain standing, and those who have not are kindly asked to sit down so we can differentiate one another through this. Thank you.
that we're saying we have a, a good problem we weren't prepared with uh, with so much fruit of the vine so I'm just if somebody hasn't received the fruit of the vine just put their hands up for just a couple of moments we don't want to miss anyone we want to wait for everybody we want to dine together we want to share the Holy Communion together if there's anybody brother Callan will be uh, at the back looking for you guys just put your hands up so as we prepare our hearts to stand before the king knowing that through the breaking of his body we are made whole again and through the breaking of his body and through his stripes we're healed so this morning if there's physical pain if there's a disease in Jesus name you'll receive healing amen Amen. We believe in the working power of Jesus Christ as the one who is alive, who is with us this morning and who is still at work. Amen, church. Amen, church. So I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 to 28. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and he had given thanks. He broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body.
Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of, of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's have a moment of prayer where we thank Him for how He has done. For through the pain He has lived for the purpose God has given Him. We thank you, Jesus. be seated my dear brothers and sisters what a wonderful day in God's presence as we can come to the final of this service we'll invite you to join as we continue the Easter day for our p.m. service from 6 uh, p.m. tonight and we'll continue with the uh, worship with the concert songs um, we glorify God. We thank for everyone that was attending with us this morning. And at the end, we'll invite you to join the fellowship in the hallway. We have good and wonderful cookies and uh, other great surprises. May God bless you and have a great lunch. Amen. <laughs>